I know how gods begin, Roger. We start as dreams. Then we walk out of dreams into the land. We are worshipped and loved and take power to ourselves. And then one day, there's no one left to worship us. And in the end, each little god and goddess takes its last journey back into dreams. And what comes after, not even we know. This is the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar discussing her experience in the 20th century. In this new modern world of secular ideals and individualism, she's just barely able to scrape out an existence working as an exotic dancer. Because it's a form of worship, right? She knows how fragile her power is, and it's made her pretty existential. It's a really clever spin on an ancient character, ripe with fascinating questions and scenarios. But this is just a snapshot. If you want more, go read Neil Gaiman's series, The Sandman. Actually, this is kind of a thing for Gaiman. A lot of deities appear in his works. Just look at American Gods. That book is literally about dispossessed and displaced deities. And just like the human characters, maybe even more than the human characters, he loves to pitch them into these fraught existential scenarios. Loves to make them ask, what is my role? What is my purpose in this life? Where do my responsibilities to humanity begin and end? My responsibilities to myself? Do I really have control over my own life? My destiny? Considering all the many reasons people create deities, the functions they serve for mankind, it's really interesting to see these archetypes in relief like this, humanized and forced to ask the same questions as you. Yes, from a narrative perspective, but also from a personal perspective, too. I think out of all the deities he's toyed with in his works, the group who casts this perspective in the starkest light is a family of incarnate concepts known simply as the Endless. <laughs> I'm so happy to say that this video is sponsored by Wren, perhaps one of the only legitimate ways to offset your carbon footprint and give back as much as you take. Definitely one of our coolest sponsors so far. More on that later. I mentioned how Gaiman puts a lot of gods and godlike beings into his works. Well, the Sandman alone is brimming over with divinity. Odin, Thor, Loki, Anubis, Bast, Theramond, Susano Ono Mikoto, the Fair Folk, Titania, Oberon, the Fates, demons and angels of every caste and creed, even more abstract ideals like chaos and order, all of these make appearances as characters in the story. But above all of them, destiny, death, destruction, despair, desire, delirium, and dream. All parts of the human experience, personified as a family of nigh-omnipotent beings, their tasks are a bit nebulous, but they sort of oversee the things that they represent. Death ushers all those who die into the next life, with all her compassion and understanding. Desire drives people to pursue their urges, fueled by a capricious understanding of what moves the heart. Destiny tends his garden, through which the paths of every life wind. You get the idea. But in all of this, there's an important question. That of responsibility. In fact, that's one of the most important aspects of Dream's story. He is the Sandman, Morpheus. Of course, he is obsessed with his role as the shaper of humanity's dreams. Absorbed by it. In many ways, bound by it. But that begins to change when he is imprisoned. A magician seeking immortality hatches a plan to trap death, arrest her, prevent her from bringing him to the next life. But instead, he catches her brother, Dream. And while he's trapped, his realm falls into decay. It begins to unravel. Dreams and nightmares enter reality. Dreamers become trapped in their sleep and don't wake for years. A great deal of damage is done to the dreams and aspirations of mankind, and to his realm, the dreaming. But when he's finally set free, strangely, 
he finds that things aren't so bad as one might expect. He embarks on a journey to set things back in order, traveling through various realms of reality and unreality, cleaning up the mess this meddling magician created. And there is a mess, certainly. But things have also gone right on working without him. Dreams created and forgotten, ambitions birthed and pursued, humanity being human. All without him. And he has to wonder, if that's the case, what is he? What is he for? What's his purpose? It's a question all of them must grapple with, and not all of them are as conflicted about it as Dream. In fact, his brother, Destruction, eventually decides to abandon his post entirely. As mankind steadily refines its capacity for destruction, to the point of developing weapons so powerful they could destroy themselves outright, Destruction becomes jaded and despondent. Destruction did not cease with my abandonment of my realm. No more than people would cease to dream should you abandon yours, he muses to dream. Perhaps it's more uncontrolled, wilder, perhaps not. But now it's no longer anyone's responsibility. People and things are still created, still exist, are destroyed. They tear down and they build. Things still change. The only difference is that no one's running it anymore. It's nothing to do with me any longer. It's theirs. They can make their own destruction. It's not my responsibility. And it's not my fault. What does it mean to be one of the endless, powerful beyond imagination, if the bounds of your usefulness begin and end with creatures as fragile as humans? If your entire existence, your role, is prefigured by what humans are already doing, doesn't it just kind of turn you into a scapegoat? A person to blame? Someone to bear the burden? There's a plot arc in the series that puts a really fine point on this exact crisis. After some tit-for-tat with Lucifer over the ownership of some equipment which was stolen from Dream during his imprisonment, they slowly develop a more amicable relationship. And eventually, Lucifer Morningstar decides that he doesn't want to rule hell anymore. He empties it of all the demons, all the damned, and hands the keys of Hell's Gates to Dream. Ten billion years spent providing a place for dead mortals to torture themselves, he says. And like all masochists, they call the shots. Burn me, freeze me, eat me, hurt me. And we did. It can be difficult to bear the burden of your own actions, thoughts, desires, feelings, the fact that these things belong to you, and that, on some level, you are responsible for them. So, humans tend to project them onto others, absolve themselves of their own internal responsibilities however they can. And often, that means creating something to carry those burdens. Gods, deities, personifications, whether it be Mother Nature or the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you can find buried within them the shreds of self which humanity needed, for whatever reason, to pull out of themselves and put into something, someone, else. Lucifer is right, and he goes on to put it into even clearer language as he laments his role leading up to his own abdication of responsibility. Why do they blame me for all their little failings? He asks Dream. They use my name as if I spend my entire day sitting on their shoulders, forcing them to commit acts they would otherwise find repulsive. The devil made me do it. I have never made one of them do anything. Never. They live their own tiny lives. I do not live their lives for them. Then they die, and they come here, having transgressed against what they believe to be right, and expect us to fulfill their desire for pain and retribution. I don't make them come here. They talk of me going around and buying souls like a fishwife come to market, never stopping to ask themselves why. I need no souls. No. They belong to themselves. They just hate to have to face up to it. This is a bit of an education for Dream. After his humbling entrapment, the slow process of understanding his role in the world draws him inexorably toward the truth that he is not necessarily 
necessary. None of the endless are. They are shepherds to the errant psyches and experiences of human beings, which is certainly helpful, but sheep can and do live without their shepherds. Dream himself makes this proclamation when he chides his younger sibling desire for their meddling in the lives of mortals. We of the endless are servants of the living. We are not their masters. We exist because they know, deep in their hearts, that we exist. When the last living thing has left this universe, then our task will be done, and we do not manipulate them. If anything, they manipulate us. From a strictly secular perspective, I think this is true for all deities. The act of creating or giving your faith to such a being is itself a type of manifestation. Whether the being in question actually exists is immaterial to the fact that the concept of it, a concept which can and does affect the world external to you, the believer, is sculpted from the material of your own life. In all of its power and influence, it's easy to feel as though it's making you. But by adopting it, by adding on to it, even just by observing it, you are making it. The role of a shepherd is only necessitated by the existence of sheep. All that a shepherd does is predicated on what sheep do. Thus are the endless. But the endless are more than that, too. I see their design, highly conceptual, based on aspects of human experience, as an overt acknowledgement from Gaiman that this whole thing isn't really about divinity. It's not about gods and how humans make them. It's about how humans make themselves. Divine beings are just one example of how humans use their creativity to shape their outlook on the world, which in turn shapes them. You build stories, stories build you. There's no morality in it. I just find it to be beautiful and salient and true. When Dream confronted Destruction about the abdication of his role, he called Destruction one of the endless. It was meant to be an invocation, a call back to responsibility. But Destruction only looked at him across the dim lantern light against the backdrop of the countless stars and said, The endless? The endless are merely patterns. The endless are ideas. The endless are wave functions. The endless are repeating motifs. The endless are echoes of darkness and nothing more. We have no right to play with their lives, to order their dreams and their desires. Echoes, your voice comes back to you in the dark. In every way, your creativity defines you. This is what the endless have taught me. I love this message in part because it puts so much onus back onto you for your existence. It helps reality to feel a little less circumstantial and a little more directed, a little more subject to your agency. In a world that feels in many ways like it's constantly right on the brink of disaster, plagued by problems we can't do much about, that feeling is so, so precious. Actually, I do know one other really meaningful way you can feel like you have a little more control over your existence. There's a certain painful nihilism that comes with knowing that, as a human being, just the act of living is coming at a cost to the planet that nurtures you. But it feels like there's so little any one person can do about it, you kind of throw your hands up and go, I guess I just have to not care. Which is awful. The nihilism starts creeping in, and it's very hard to put to rest. But it doesn't have to be that way. What if I told you that there was a way to quantify all the little ways that you're impacting the world around you, to break it down into numbers, and then take a passive action that barely impacts your life at all, but still basically erases much of the damage you're doing just by living? A way to absolve yourself of the passive guilt most humans carry around with them every day to feel a little better about the state of the world? Well, with Ren, it's actually incredibly easy. Ren is an app that allows you to track how much carbon your daily life is releasing into the atmosphere, and then gives you options for ways you can contribute a little bit of money to projects whose efforts will offset that damage, and in many cases, even outweigh the damage that would have been done. It sounds a little too good to be true, 
which is why so many companies have jumped on this model. There are a lot of services out there offering to do this, but unfortunately, what a lot of them do just amounts to greenwashing. In a lot of cases, they're just outright scams. So it's good to be a little wary of this concept. Except when it comes to Ren. Because they are the real deal. They've created a system to actually make this concept work. They have a small portfolio of less than a dozen projects working to bring down carbon impact, which they monitor extremely carefully to make sure they're using the funds in the best way possible and sticking to their promises. That also provides a little bit of security too, because should something happen to any one of these projects, your contribution will still be able to go out and continue helping to undo the damage. It costs way less than you might expect to virtually erase the negative impacts your lifestyle has on the world, but to be honest, living guilt-free is kind of priceless. This will make such a difference in how you feel about the world, your optimism for the future. So, if you've ever had these sort of nihilistic, agonizing thoughts about being part of the problem, here's an extremely easy way to change all of that. And the best part? If you sign up now using the link on screen or down in the description, Ren will cover your entire first month of offsets. They'll take the guilt away for free for a whole month. Once you know how good that feels, I can almost guarantee you'll want to keep it up. Definitely follow our link and go give Ren a try. At any rate, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next time. Bye!